In this class, you're going to learn how to find the area under a curve using definite integrals. So first of all, what do we mean by the area under a curve? So if I just make up the graph of some function, so let's say in this case, some kind of polynomial function, which might have a graph like that. So that might be like a cubic function or some polynomial. It doesn't really matter what the graph looks like. What do we mean by the area under that curve? Well, let's just let this be f of x. So our function is f of x, so the curve is y equals f of x. Well, we mean the area under the curve, but also between two limits. So basically two vertical lines. And let's just call these points a and b, where those vertical lines come from the x-axis. So the area under the curve is actually the area under the curve between the x-axis and between the two limits. So that's what we usually just call the area under the curve. So what we're going to do in this class is we're going to have a quick chat about the theory and then we're going to work these two examples of slightly different types of function just to see how the process plays out. So it turns out that to find the shaded area here, all you have to do is set up a definite integral and evaluate it. Once you evaluate that definite integral and get your final number, your final answer, that answer is the area under that curve. So in other words, if we set up the integral between the two limits, so integral between a and b of whatever the function is, so f of x integrating with respect to x, so dx, whatever this evaluates to gives us the area. So in other words, the area equals that. So when you're practicing evaluating definite integrals, you're not really initially thinking about areas like this, you're just practicing this technique, but those numbers you're getting, those solutions are actually the area under that curve. So areas under a curve are just a direct application of definite integrals. So the technique for solving areas is really just the technique for solving definite integrals. So usually with these questions, you would get a diagram. We'll draw diagrams in a moment. If you don't have a diagram, it's fine. You can still evaluate the area just using the, the kind of formula here, using the definite integral. But sometimes having a diagram can be useful. So I've already thought about the graph of this function, which is a polynomial. In particular, it's a quadratic function, which is going to make a parabolic graph. Um, so just quickly to fire up a diagram, just so that we can kind of get orientated as to what we're dealing with here. So this would be a parabola, which has got a y-intercept at 4, and it's got a turning point at 1, 1. So let's just say that's somewhere there, and it's going to make that usual parabolic shape, something like that. We're integrating here between 1 and 4 because we want the area between 1 and 4. This information will be given in the question. So this point here is at 1, so we're drawing our, this is equivalent to our point A, so we're drawing our vertical line there at 1. And then let's just say that 4 is over here. So this is 1, this is 4. And we'll just draw another vertical line on there. So it's that shaded area there that we're trying to find in this question. So we don't need to think too much now about the diagram. We just go ahead and set up our definite integral. The answer we get will be this area here. One benefit to having a diagram, you can check to see whether your answer makes sense. If you get a huge number when it looks like it should be a small number or vice versa, then you might just want to check your working. So having a diagram is useful in that sense. So we're going to say here that the area, the shaded area, is equal to the integral between 1 and 4. Remember, your limits go bottom to top, small to larger, so a small number on the bottom. So 1 to 4 of the function, which is 3x squared minus 6x plus 4 dx. So I'm assuming that you're already familiar with definite integrals. If you're not, then you can either check out another class on definite integration or just follow along here because the technique is fairly straightforward. So we're just going to use the power rule to integrate this. How you integrate will depend upon the function. This one needs one of the trig rules. You might have to use the chain rule or one of the other rules. It just depends what type of function, polynomials, we can integrate using the power rule. So we're going to integrate just using that rule. So the first term will become x cubed increasing the power by 1, divide by that new power, so we'll end up with 3x cubed over 3, but the 3's cancel, meaning you would just get an x cubed. Um, so you might need a second line of work in there, I'm just going to do it all in one line. The same here, the x term, which is an x to the 1, remember, is going to go up to an x squared, divide by that x squared, or divide by the 2, sorry, 6 divided by 2 is going to be 3, so it's going to be minus 3x squared. The 4, a constant, just integrates to 4x. So with definite integrals, if you're not familiar with those, you just get from here to here in the same way, using the power rule, 
but we put the answer in a square bracket and we move the numbers called the limits over to the right hand side of the square bracket. So that's nothing in particular to do with finding areas, that's just how we do definite integrals, okay? So integrate as normal, put in a square bracket, put the limits here and here. Then we just go ahead and we substitute in the limits for the x value, starting with the top limit, the upper limit. Good practice to use a bracket for these, so we're gonna put a four in here to give us four cubed, minus three times four squared, plus four times four, it's gonna go straight to making that a 16. Then we subtract, so it's always a subtract, the lower limit subbed in. So one cubed is just one. One squared is just one times three is minus three. Four times one is just four. So this here is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's one of the big main results in, in, in calculus, which links together um, integration and differentiation. But this rule here basically tells us how to evaluate a definite integral. So upper limit subbed in first minus the lower limit substituted into the uh, function here. Then it's just a case of evaluating the numbers. So just do this carefully. Sometimes these are calculator questions, sometimes they're non-calc. If it's non-calc, just be careful with the numeracy. So four cubed, four times four times four is 64. Um, four squared is 16 times three is 48. So it's minus 48 plus 16. So just take your time with these, make sure you get the numeracy right. This is gonna be five minus three, which is two. And then just basically carry the numeracy forward. So here we're gonna have, um, that's gonna be 80 minus 48 is 32. 32 minus two is 30. So the answer comes out to be 30. If this was just a definite integral, that would be your final answer, but we're interpreting this result as the area. So that's basically telling us that this area here is equal to 30. Because it's an area, it needs some kind of unit measure. So we don't have units in particular um, when we're working the x and y axis. So it's not like these are in any particular unit. So we just use a generic unit like units. And because we're dealing with area, it's going to be unit squared. So the answer here would be 30 units squared. Now that looks like quite a big number, doesn't it, for a fairly small looking area. But this, although the one to the four obviously is just three, which is quite small, the height here is actually a lot more significant than it looks on my diagram. So I think from memory, this point here um, is actually much higher up than it looks on my diagram, uh, meaning that that area is fine. I think by the time you get to this point here, it's something like 40 or thereabouts. So the answer here is actually fine. That's the benefit of having a diagram or checking the diagram beforehand, just to make sure the number does make sense. Okay, right, so let's just take that technique and fire on to the second example. Doesn't really matter that it's a trig function, we're gonna use the same technique, setting up the definite integral. The only thing that's different is how you'll go about integrating this. So the trig functions are quite easy to integrate, so it shouldn't be a problem. Let's just maybe do a quick diagram here as well. So again, just really for orientation, just so we kind of know what we're dealing with and to make sure the answer kind of makes sense. So two cosine x, that's like cosine x, but the amplitude is two, so it's been stretched up and stretched down by a factor of two, meaning that it looks kind of like a normal cosine graph, but this top point would be two, and the, the lowest point, the minimum value, would be minus two. So pi by six and pi by four, so, by the way, this notation here, these square brackets called a closed interval, just gives you the same information as the limits here, one and four, it's between one and four here, this also means between these values. These are in radians. If you want to put them in degrees, if you're happier with degrees, pi by six is 30 degrees, pi by four is 45. So this is between 30 degrees and 45. It might be useful to do that. Not so much necessarily for working the question, but just for labeling it on the diagram. So this point here, remember, is 90 degrees or pi by two radians. It's good if you can just work between radians and degrees. Um, kind of seamlessly, 45 degrees then is halfway along to there. 30 degrees is gonna be about here. So you can see that these are actually quite close together. So here we've got 30 degrees, here we've got 45, meaning that our shaded area here is quite small. That means that when we, obviously it looks very small compared to like this or compared to this. So when we work through the definite integral, we expect a fairly small answer. If we get some number like 30 or Big, or even a larger number, then it's probably going to be wrong. So we're just setting up our integral between the limits. So 
using either degrees or radians, we should really stick with radians because that's how the question was presented. If you need to convert those to degrees, then that's okay. So it's going to be the integral between pi by 6 and pi by 4. Remember, pi by 6 is a smaller number there because you're dividing by the larger number. This is 30 degrees, this is 45, so a smaller number on the, on the bottom part. And then the function is 2 cosine x. Okay, so cosine just integrates to positive sine as opposed to the derivative, which goes to negative sine. So this is just going to become 2 sine x. So that's quite convenient, quite straightforward. They're quite often presented on a formula sheet. If not, they're fairly easy to remember. And just moving your limits over, so pi by 4 here, pi by 6. So this will, if this was non-calculator, this will start to test your trig values a little. So we're just subbing in the value so we get 2 sine, replacing the x with the upper limit, which is pi by 4, subtracting from that 2 sine, uh, replacing the x with the lower limit, pi by 6. So just exactly what we did over here, using the brackets, it's good practice to keep it separated in brackets. And then we just need to evaluate this. So if it was a calculator question, you would just fire all that in the calculator. This time we're going to try and do it manually. So these values you just need to know from trig exact values or use the triangle version that you might know about to be able to get these values. Ideally you should just know them off the top of your head. So the sine of pi by 4 is 1 over root 2, meaning that 2 times that is going to be 2 over root 2. Probably don't really need the brackets anymore, but I'll just leave them there for this line of working. Pi by 6, so that's uh, 30 degrees. The sine of 30 degrees is 1 half. 2 times 1 half, obviously, is 1, so it's going to be minus 1. So that's, I mean, that's okay as a final answer. You could maybe put that in a calculator and get a decimal answer, or you could tidy it up a little using surge. So, for example, you could make this uh, 2 over root 2 minus making the 1 into root 2 over uh, root 2, which gives you 2 minus root 2 over root 2. You could take that further by rationalising the fraction, which you would achieve by times in this by root 2 over root 2. Don't worry if you're not familiar with this. I mean, at this stage here, the answer is like fairly respectable. And for a calculator question, you would just put that in the calculator. This bit here is just to tidy it up a little. If you did that, you would end up getting 2 uh, root 2 minus 2 over 2. A bunch of 2s are going to simplify there, and you will end up with root 2 minus 1. In fact, just root 2 minus 1. So that would be the final answer, uh, non-calculator. Okay, right, cool. So notice that that number, root 2 minus 1, is a really small number, because root 2 is like 1 point something. 1 point something minus 1 is going to be point something. So we expected it to be a pretty small area. It's come out to be a small area. So we can say that for this one, the area is root 2 minus 1, using the way that we've decided to go for it, root 2 minus 1 units squared. So what are the main takeaways from this class? Well, first of all, know the definition of the area under a curve. It means the area under the curve, but also between the limits and the x-axis. Know that that area is represented by the definite integral between those limits, so there's nothing else. It's really just about using the definite integral, working through the steps in this kind of logical fashion, using the brackets to keep things nice and neat and tidy, and just maybe try to use your diagram to have some kind of expectation for what the final answer might come out to be. Anytime you can use a diagram to give some kind of guesstimate, I guess, for the answer. It makes it easy for you then to check and see whether it makes sense. For example, if that answer had been associated with this question and 30 had been the answer for this one, then we might think that something's gone wrong. So just checking your answer off of the, the diagram. So definite integrals basically are the technique that we use for evaluating areas under a curve. And it's just a case of applying that definite integral working through the working and then remembering to use your to make it in units at the end as well because although these are just a kind of algebraic process we are actually finding something which has got a unit so just putting your units in at the end. So I hope that that technique makes sense. It's fairly straightforward if you're already familiar with integration and definite integrals. If not, focus more on learning the definite integration technique because using the definite integral to find the area is just a direct application. So I hope that helps and if you've got any questions or comments then just leave them in the comment section below. Thank you.